the Pantheon, the Temple of All Gods. Most temples are just stone boxes full of columns. This is different. This is a challenge to gravity. To this day, it is the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. Think about that. No steel beams, no internal support, just concrete floating above your head. If it were built by anyone else, it would have collapsed on opening day. The secret is weight management. Our engineers didn't use the same concrete for everything. At the base, the walls are thick, and the concrete is mixed with heavy basalt to anchor the building. As the dome rises, the mix changes. At the very top, they used volcanic pumice, light as a sponge. And the hole in the center? The oculus? Civilians think it's to let sunlight in or to see the gods. The engineer knows the truth. It's a compression ring. It removes the weight from the roof's weakest point, the center, and locks the entire structure in place. Does it rain inside? Yes. The floor is slightly curved to drain the water, but the building stands. Empires fell, religions changed, but Rome's roof hasn't moved an inch. The baths of Caracalla, cathedrals of water. Do not insult this place by calling it a public toilet. This is a palace built for the people. Imagine a structure larger than the capital, covered in marble, gold, and mosaics, where one six hundred people can bathe at the same time. The engineering here is not visible. It is underground. To keep the caldarium, the hot room, steaming and the pools heated, there is a hell operating right beneath the bather's feet. Hundreds of slaves work day and night in suffocating tunnels, feeding tons of wood into gigantic furnaces. The hydraulic system needs to move millions of liters of fresh water from the aqueducts, heat it, distribute it, and then drain the filthy water. It is an industrial operation hidden behind walls of luxury. Emperor Caracalla was a monster, a murderer. But he built this. Why? Because when the poorest citizen of Rome can walk in here, sweat in a marble sauna, and wash next to a senator, he feels like a king. It is engineering applied to social peace. Give them luxury, and they won't ask who you killed to get the throne. The hippocaust? The artificial summer? Barbarians tolerate the cold. They huddle around open fires in smoke-filled huts, coughing and freezing. Us? We killed winter. This is the reason a Roman general can live in rainy Britain or on the frozen border of Germania and still walk barefoot in his bedroom. We don't heat the air directly, we heat the structure. The engineer raises the villa floor on stacks of tiles, called pili. This creates an empty space beneath your feet. Outside, a furnace burns constantly. The hot air and smoke are drawn into this space, circulating under the floor and rising through hollow bricks in the walls before escaping through the roof. The result? The floor is warm. The walls are warm. There is no smoke in the room, just steady, radiant heat. It is a masterpiece of thermodynamics. It requires a lot of wood and slave labor, of course, but it sends a clear message to the locals. Rome doesn't adapt to the weather. We make the weather adapt to us. Ruina Montium, the wrecking of mountains. When Rome wants gold, we don't use pans in the river like sad prospectors. We use physics to wipe entire mountains off the map. Look at what we did at Las Medulas in Spain. The process is terrifying. Our engineers dig deep, narrow tunnels into the mountain, with no exit. At the top, we dam entire rivers into massive reservoirs. When the signal is given, the floodgates open. The water crashes down with unimaginable fury. As it enters the tunnels, it compresses the air. The pressure has nowhere to go. The result? The mountain explodes from the inside out. Tons of rock are pulverized instantly. The mountain just collapses. Then we wash the rubble to find the gold. Pliny the Elder saw this and said it was the work of titans, more dangerous than war. And he was right. It is industrial mining on a biblical scale. We changed the geography of the earth to pay our legions. Trajan's hexagonal harbor. The lung of Rome. Here is a logistical problem. Rome has a million mouths to feed, but it is not on the sea. The Tiber River is dangerous, and the old port of Ostia was always silting up. Grain ships from Egypt were sinking in storms waiting to dock. Emperor Trajan didn't pray to Neptune. He hired Apollodorus of Damascus, his engineer. The solution was bold. If the coast doesn't offer a safe harbor, we dig one. They excavated a gigantic artificial lake inland, connected to the sea by canals. But it wasn't a circle. It was a perfect hexagon. Why a hexagon? 
pure geometry. A circle wastes qui space. A square has difficult corners. The hexagon offers the maximum amount of straight line for ships to dock simultaneously, protecting them from waves. A hundred ships could unload at the same time. The grain went straight into massive warehouses surrounding it. Without this geometric shape dug into the mud, Rome would have starved. It is proof that mathematics keeps the empire alive, just as much as the sword. Barbigal Mills, the flour factory. Future historians will say industry started in England with steam. They are wrong. It started in Gaul, with Roman water. Near Arles, we built something that shouldn't exist in antiquity. It wasn't a lonely water wheel turning in a creek. It was an industrial complex. We took water from an aqueduct at the top of a steep hill and built two parallel rows of water wheels, eight wheels on each side, 16 in total. The water turned the first, fell to the next, turned that one, and so on, cascading down. It was mass automation. These machines ground 4.5 tons of flour a day. That is enough bread to feed 10,000 people or an entire legion and its auxiliaries without a single slave sweating at the pestle. We turned gravity and water into food. The world would have to wait over 1,500 years to see a factory like this again. We didn't just conquer the land. We mechanized survival. The Nemi ships. Floating palaces. Caligula was mad. Everyone knows that. But the engineers he forced to work were geniuses. On the small volcanic lake of Nemi, he ordered the construction of two gigantic ships. These weren't warships. They were floating villas. Imagine mosaic floors, marble columns, plumbing with hot water, and gardens, all floating on water. The excess was disgusting, but the technology was sublime. They used lead sheathing on the hull to protect the wood, something modern navies would only do centuries later. They had crank-operated bilge pump systems that were flawless, but the real discovery was in the rotating platforms. We found bronze ball bearings. Understand this. The world forgot this technology for 1,500 years. Leonardo da Vinci drew it, but Romans built it. We used precision mechanics to rotate statues for an emperor's amusement, while the rest of the world was still using wooden logs to roll stones. Caligula died murdered, his ships sank, but the engineering proved we were millennia ahead. Hadrian's Wall, the stone frontier. Every empire has a limit. Emperor Hadrian was the first to admit it. He looked at the north of Britannia, saw only fog, rain, and blue-painted Picts, and said, Enough. Civilization ends here. So, we cut the island in half. We didn't just build a fence. We built a stone scar 73 miles long from coast to coast. The engineering is total control. The wall is 10 feet wide and 15 feet high. At every exact Roman mile, there is a mile castle. Every third of a mile, a watchtower. But the genius part is what you don't see from the front, the vallum. A giant ditch dug behind the wall, flanked by earth mounds. Why? Because we didn't even trust the Britons we had already conquered. Hadrian's Wall was an isolated kill zone. No one entered, no one left, without Rome's permission. On the south side of the wall, bathhouses, wine, Latin, and taxes. On the north side, death, cold, and barbarism. The wall is the greatest engineering statement ever made. This is my world. What lies outside does not matter. The Tunnel of Claudius, the Fucino Emissary. This is what happens when Roman stubbornness meets a mountain. Lake Fucino flooded fertile lands and caused disease. Emperor Claudius decided to drain it. The problem? There was a mountain in the way. Most civilizations would give up. We didn't. Our engineers designed a tunnel nearly four miles long through solid rock. But we didn't just start at the ends. That would take decades. They dug vertical shafts, called pute going down hundreds of feet from the mountain surface to the tunnel level. 30,000 men worked for 11 years, day and night, digging in opposite directions in the dark, guided only by geometric calculations and oil lamps. They met in the middle with near-perfect precision. When the sluice gates opened, the lake disappeared, sucked into the earth, emerging miles away in the Leary River. It was the longest tunnel in the world until the 19th century. It took 1,800 years for humanity to have the guts or the madness to try something like this again. The Constantinian Shift For 300 years, Rome tried to erase Christianity. 